phone went dead after that. Mostly, I just wanted to say I love you. Have you done anything to physically hurt her yet? Yes, ma'am, I have. If you're anything like me, you probably wonder what it's like to be a police dispatcher. I mean, you get to help a lot of people during crisis, and being the one who helps save someone's life can be rewarding, I would guess. However, there's a reason why this job is stressful. What if you can't help them on time? Or what if the other person on the other end of the phone gets killed, and you can't do anything but just hope and wait that the police get there on time? This iceberg by Greenboy72 does a really great job in detailing some of the most gruesome and horrifying 911 police calls. If you guys really like this type of content and you guys want me to go deeper into the iceberg, then please let me know in the comments below. Also, I have zero subs, so if one of you guys would subscribe to me and make me feel a lot better. Anyways, okay, that's it. Bye. This is the roof price of the tear starts off with Ruth Price. Ruth Price was an elderly woman who lived alone in a neighborhood that she probably thought was safe. You often don't expect someone to barge in your house, especially when you're currently in the house. I mean, that's what nightmares are made out of. But unfortunately for this lady, all of this came true. The following audio is a 911 call Ruth makes and I'm warning you that the following clip is blood curdling. Uh, this is the roof price of 3877. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, there's some guy been um, checking the place out. How? Oh. Well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And yes. And uh, said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. Unfortunately, after the clip, many people say that she was beaten to her death. On another note, there's a lot of debate on whether or not this call is a hoax or it's real. Just to break this down briefly, People who believe this is a hoax say that this is a clip just used for police dispatcher training. Along with this, what gives credit to this idea is the fact of how inexperienced and how poorly this police dispatcher handled the situation. Some people even claim that when Ruth drops her phone, the audio still remains clear, meaning like the audio and the scream doesn't sound like it's trailing off. But then again, just because it's used in training doesn't make it fake. And aside from that, just listen to how real and genuine she sounds. Either this is real or she's extremely talented in voice acting. At the end of the day, it's up for you to decide. At this point, most of you guys already know who Nicole Brown Simpson is, and how could you not, considering that this was the most disgusting case that showed how corrupt the court system could be, but it still can't hurt to go over it. Nicole Brown Simpson was OJ Simpson's wife, and OJ Simpson was a former NFL football star who was involved in a lot of family shows and at one point was even beloved by America. However, just because he put out a good persona on television doesn't mean he was like that behind closed doors and no one knew that better than Nicole Brown Simpson. Just keep in mind that the following call is just one 911 call that was made. There were many others like this and even worse. Okay. Oh, 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 oh
Apparently, this fight all started because OJ was infuriated by the comments Nicole made about him on National Enquirer. And basically, for those who don't know what National Enquirer is, it's basically all those magazines you see right before the checkout line in a grocery store. You know those magazines with the big bold letters that expose celebrities? Yeah, it was that. With the help of Nicole, the magazines exposed how vulnerable OJ was when she included an apology in which he supposedly said, Baby, I was a fool to let you slip through my fingers. You're the best thing that ever happened to me. The magazine also showed an unfaithful side to OJ with a comment Nicole made saying that he cheated on her so much that she feared he would get AIDS. What really made OJ blazing was the pictures of Nicole's ex on the magazine. And unfortunately, Nicole would be found dead on June 1994, stabbed to death. And even worse news, OJ would be found not guilty for the murder of Nicole despite finding the murder weapons because the microbes in the soil had ruined the ability to find any DNA on it. OJ would eventually go to prison, but not for the murder of his wife, but for armed robbery and kidnapping relating to the theft of sports memorabilia in 2008. His supposed best friend in prison would reveal a disgusting thing that OJ would say about the murder weapon to him. He told him, if the knife is rusted, I can't be busted. OJ was never held responsible for the murder of Nicole. Throughout this ordeal, everyone's been trying to find something good in all the pain and suffering. And then there are the wonderful memories, memories of the thousands of people who died. Yesterday at a memorial service, someone said Sandy Bradshaw had it. Whatever it was, Sandy Bradshaw was just one of the flight attendants and passengers on Flight 93. This event would later be known as the 9-11 terrorist attacks. During the takeover, Sandy was able to phone her husband, Phil, to update him on what was happening. In an interview, Phil explains what he was told by Sandy. Today, in what he calls his first and only interview, Sandy's husband, Phil, spoke with me. Um, she said that she had seen one of them who was sitting in the back of first class, a short guy with a dark complexion, looked Islamic or whatever. And she didn't know if the pilots were in control of the airplane or if they were. She knew that they had turned around. They were over a, a river. At the time, I thought it was the Mississippi, but I think it was right there at Pittsburgh. She said that they were trying, well, th that they were getting hot water together in the pots from the gaff galley and they were gonna throw it on and try to take over the airplane and she wanted to know if I had any other ideas for her. But do you, do you remember what some of her last words were to you? Um, well, we talked about the family and the kids and we talked about uh, how much we loved each other. She said, Phil, everybody's running in first class. I've got to go, bye. That's the last you remember? And that's, the phone went dead after that. I, I, these were the monsters responsible for the crash of Flight 93. Because of their actions, passengers on their plane were forced to make their last calls to loved ones, and I can only imagine how horrible that would feel. I wouldn't even know where to begin if that were me, so my heart goes out for them. I'm warning you that the following calls are very painful to listen to. Passenger Linda Grundland phoned her sister Elsa at 9.46 a.m about 18 minutes into the hijacking, leaving this message on her home answering machine. Elsa, it's Lynn. Um, I only have a minute. I'm on United 93, and it's been hijacked uh, by terrorists who say they have a bomb. Apparently, they uh, have flown a couple of planes into the World Trade Center already, and it looks like they're going to take this one down as well. Mostly, I just wanted to say I love you, and I'm going to miss you. <laughs> and and please give my love to my dad. And... Mostly, I just love you, and I just wanted to tell you that. I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell you that again or not. Flight attendant C.C. Lyles phoned her husband, Lorne, at 9.47 a.m., about 19 minutes into the hijacking, leaving this message on their answering machine. Hi, baby. I'm... Baby, you have to listen to me carefully. I'm on a plane that's been hijacked. I'm on the plane. I'm calling from the plane. I want to tell you I love you. Please tell my children that I love them very much. 
and I'm so sorry, babe. Um, I don't know what to say. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Bye. In the end, these brave Americans were able to fight back and crash in a field far away from the terrorists intended target. Ultimately, they sacrificed themselves in order to save thousands of lives. Emergency, what are you reporting? Yeah, we're in a, we're in I'm, I'm sorry, your cell phone's cutting out. We're going north 125. Mm -hmm. And our accelerator is stuck. I'm sorry? Our accelerator is stuck. We're on 125 and we're in Okay, northbound 125, where are you passing? We are passing, uh, where are we passing? We're, we're, we're going 120, Mission Gorge. We're in, we're in trouble. We can't, well, there's no brakes. Okay. Gorge, in freeway, half mile. Okay, and you don't have the ability to, like, turn the vehicle off or anything? We're approaching the intersection. We're approaching the intersection. Okay. Uh, we're approaching the intersection. Hold on. Pray. Pray. Okay. Oh, shoot. Oh. 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 Okay. Hello? The person talking on the phone was Chris Lestrella, and he was one of the four passengers in this defective car. Chris tells the dispatcher that the accelerator is stuck and no matter what they do, the brakes do not seem to work and the car only seems to pick up speed. Witnesses even said that the Lexus topped speeds of over 120 miles per hour before launching and bursting into flames off the intersection. The car flew off into a ditch at Mission George Road and unfortunately, along with Chris Lestrella, the driver officer Mark Saylor, his wife Cleophi, and daughter Mahala were all killed in the crash. Apparently, the car was a temporary loan given to them from Bob Baker Lexus as the family waited for the car to be repaired by the dealership. And looking into previous reports made by past users, the dealership received warnings about such problems even before this incident, but of course they ignored them. Another cause for concern were the large floor mats which could have been one of the reasons why the driver, Mark Saylor, could not properly hit the brakes in time. After their deaths, Toyota issued a flurry of recalls totaling 10 million vehicles in order to fix problems with floor mats, sticky pedals, and faulty brakes. Call started on Friday, March 6, 2015 at 14 hours 11 minutes. Charles Hendrick Foster was an old man who did a series of three phone calls to the police where he detailed the abusive things he wanted to do to his wife. There's really not much to say on this case other than it's clear that during these phone calls, he was in the middle of a psychotic state of mind. If you want to listen to the entire call, the link will be in the description below, but just note that I have shortened the cause a bit. 911. Uh, just a minute, please. Uh, uh, do you need police or ambulance there? Yes, ma'am, this is serious. Okay, do you need police or an ambulance? Would you shut up and listen to me for a second? Oh, stupid phone. I will call you back. Do you need the... Yeah, 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 yeah. Call started on Friday, March 6, 2015 at 14 hours, 12 minutes and 48 seconds. 911. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Hi, can I help you? My name is Charles Hendricks Foster. I am about ready to kill my wife. What's your this address? This is not a joke. Shut up and listen to me. Okay, first I need your address and then I'll shut up. Shut up and listen. Ugh. I'm not kidding, ma'am. I deserve to go to jail for murder. I want to kill her. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Ugh. People have commented that one possible reason why Charles was so agitated was because he was dealing with multiple voices in his head. Another sign that showed mental illness was the fact that he was calling for the police to remove him, when in fact no one was holding him against his will. He shows many discrepancies that possibly point at an internal battle between his voices and his conscience. Tell me your name again. My name is... How stupid can you people get? My name is Charles Hendricks 
foster. Where is your wife right now? She's sitting right next to me. Okay. What's her name? Gail. Chorus. Have you done anything to physically hurt her yet? Yes, ma'am, I have. What have you done? I punched her in the face because I really want to kill her right now. Just send a f***ing cop out okay, here I already, and let it go sir? with that. Bye-bye. Uh, hey, sir. Police would find Gail Corris breathing heavily with a stab wound on her chest. In the end, Charles would be charged with second-degree attempted murder.